afternoon and uh, welcome to pavinari lecture 6 this is organized by gender in physics working group more popularly known as jipwg as many of you know this group was set up under indian physics association in 2017 with a aim to promote gender equity in physics profession in india the group has been actively working in promoting the awareness on gender issues and understanding discipline specific issues and also liaises with similar national and international groups a first national conference dealing with gender in physics issues was organized in 2019 at university of hyderabad and deliberations culminated into hyderabad charter which has received more than 500 endorsements the jipwg ipa and tifr will be co organizing iupap supported international conference on women in physics in july 2023 on the eve of equip the lecture series pavinari is started with an aim to cherish the creditable work of women physicists sometimes not so well known pavinari stands for padartha vigyan ki nariya that is women in physics today is the sixth lecture in this series previous lectures are also available in the youtube before i hand over the mic uh, to dr kuntala who will introduce today's speaker Uh, i would just like to add that jipwg also has started the surveys to create this uh, gender statistics it includes the data on women physicists in india the data on um, gender statistics in various lecture series and in the conferences and departments some of these are already you have seen on the social media otherwise i'll also put some links here and it's the uh, information is available on our web page so i request you all to help us in collecting the statistics because that's the first step in generating the data and understanding the problems so that we can solve them so coming back to today's lecture today's lecture will be on rosalind franklin and we will have uh, professor shikha verma telling about this so i request now dr kuntala to introduce today's speaker yeah yes so uh, thank you vandana ma'am um, today is this uh, pavinari lecture series uh, on women physicist this is the sixth lecture which will be delivered by professor shika verma so uh, let me give a brief introduction um, shika did her msc from iit kanpur in 1984 then she moved to syracuse university new york to pursue her phd she did her phd on electronic structure of uh, monolayer surfaces using synchrotron radiation uh, which is actually uh, in the area of experimental condensed matter physics and completed her phd in 1990 then during 1990 to 1991 she was a research associate at uh, case western reserve university ohio then from 1991 to 1993 she was an associate lecturer and research associate at uh, university of wisconsin milwaukee 1993 to 1994 she was a visiting scientist at university of california santa barbara then she joined institute of physics as a faculty in 1994 and then became a professor in 2010 then she retired in april 2023 from institute of physics foundation shikha uh, works on various fields related to iron beam accelerators um, various spectroscopy and microscopy facilities for studying the electronic structure optical response transport behavior and sensing nature of 2d materials quantum dots nanostructured surfaces and biomimetic platforms She is currently the chairperson of Accelerator User Committee of Inter University Accelerator Center, New Delhi, and is the editorial board member of Pramana and Frontier. She is currently a member. She is currently the member of SCRB and DST committees like CRG, SRG, NPDF, as well as committees for women in science like Power Grant, Power Fellow, WEA, Wise Kiran, etc. 
She is the chair of the GIPWG Condensed Metal Group and is a strong advocate for equity in science. She has been making strong efforts for spreading the awareness of gender related issues. So everyone, let us welcome Professor Shika Verma to deliver her lecture. Uh, thank you, Kuntla, for your uh, very kind introduction. Uh, also, I would like to, on the, on the onset, I'd like to thank IPA uh, for giving me this opportunity and honor to give this talk in the Pavinari series. It's a six series. And I would also like to thank uh, Vandana and Shubhavati for their many efforts in this uh, GIPWG. Uh, as I will show in the first slide, uh, that uh, I will also first, uh, let me also share my slides. Uh, they have done a lot of effort in getting this IQIP conference uh, to India. Uh, so many thanks to both of them. I would also like to thank um, uh, many uh, Indian senior scientists have been involved. I, cannot, I may not be able to take everybody's name, but some of the people who have uh, recognized the work of Indian uh, women scientists and also from uh, international scenario, uh, I will take name of Professor Rohini Godbole for her work on Lilavati Daughters and Professor Sulbha Kulkarni for her recent book, uh, Ziddi, in which she has uh, uh, given the essay of many uh, scientists from across the world. So thanks to both of them and also thanks to GIPWG for taking this uh, issue of women scientists in India, which we all know is... Uh, uh, and also the Hyderabad uh, conference also raised these issues of women. So this is the IQIP conference 2023. Uh, it is an international conference of women and we are honored that uh, it is coming to India in uh, July 23 and a lot of work is going on and this Pavinari series is also a part of uh, these uh, efforts. Uh, so let me go back to the, the talk of today, this Pavinari series. It's uh, actually a talk on the discovery of DNA, structure of DNA. And I will put a disclaimer right in the beginning that uh, I'm uh, not from biology. So, so I hope I'll be able to do justice with this talk. So what is DNA? DNA or deoxyribonucleic acid as is called is a molecule of hereditary. It is carried in chromosomes of all living cells. DNA determines the traits of offsprings of all the organisms as large or as small as a single cell. Understanding DNA so is a key to comprehending this transmission of blueprint of life across generations. And it is key to understanding virus, vaccine, whatever, hereditary, tailored medicine, gene database, all these are very, very important issues in today's scenario. So the first to identify DNA as a distinct molecule was this Frederick Meischer. He was at the University of Basel. And in 1869, he isolated, he called it nuclein. Now we know it as DNA or an acid, nucleic acid. And he found that it is rich in nitrogen and phosphorus. So even in those days, he knew that it is rich in nitrogen and phosphorus. The DNA, as I mentioned, was discovered in 1869, but it was only in 1940s. It was becoming clear that DNA is a source of genetic material after the studies of Oswald Every. And they had showed that the harmless bacteria can be transformed to a active bacteria, a virulent, and that made the case that DNA as a source of genetic material. The next step was then in the, so we are talking about 1940s. Next step was to find what is its structure of DNA, and this so at in 19 before this study of every the issue was is protein the genetic material or is DNA the genetic material, and after that it came up that if DNA is the genetic material, that what is its structure, how the basic unit of hereditary works, how the, it, how the hereditary thing, how the traits get passed from one generation to next generation. Now comes the first diffraction is actually another lady uh, who, again, we don't know this name. And only when I started start reading about uh, Rosalind Franklin, I came across this. There's another lady, Florence Bell, and she is designated as the person who had taken first X-ray diffraction image of uh, DNA. You will see the difference as we go along how the DNA uh, XRD images have evolved. And uh, 
So the one clear thing, which is, uh, okay, what is XRD? So in diffraction, what we do, we have our source. And since um, I don't know how many people are on YouTube, but there might be some students, there has to be a source of X-ray, which is usually a X-ray tube. And then you will have the sample, in this case, DNA fiber in the middle of the path. And you see the diffraction pattern. Uh, it can be constructive or destructive patterns will form, and this will be called the image. It, 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 uh, it used to be taken on a film, and now we can even take it on by computer and so on. But this is a X-ray film which has been taken. And what it shows that it has this arc, if you see in the top and the bottom of the image, and it gives you the idea of the separations. All, all the spots in a diffraction space, yeah, yeah this is a diffraction a diffractometer or film, will give you idea of the separations between some of the atoms in your sample. In this case, this separation is important. And this arc, separation of arc from the center is telling you the separation between something in the, uh, as, as I go next, you will see what separations it is talking about. So she did PhD with William Asprey, and this is a figure from her thesis. And this is that same photo, which I showed you from her thesis. And what they suggested was it had this uh, ladder-like structure. And each, each step of the ladder is a base, what they thought, Some, something, they were not sure what it is, but something is there. And this typical distance between the two steps of the ladder is what is the separation between this middle point and the top arc, okay? And this is what is repeating itself. And these images kept get, getting better, and uh, that's, that is the story of DNA. So this is the model and it shows the base is stacking along the rigid column and at regular intervals. This Florence, after PhD, uh, she was in 1941, she was summoned for military services. We should remember World War II is about to come uh, or it is going on 1939 to 1945 is World War II. And so she was in Women Auxiliary Air Force and she never returned back to physics. Now, brief introduction of DNA as we know today. So first I'll tell you what we already know. So the, Hopefully that will be easier to understand what we were looking for in those days. So this is a structure of DNA. And in the lower, I have written B DNA. So there are various forms of DNA. This is one of the DNA. And as we go along, you will, we will be able to tell what B DNA is. And this is the model of DNA. Uh, so main thing is it has a helical structure. So this is one helix and this is the other helix. So actually there are two helix. So it is called double helix. This again was a very long mystery. If DNA is a helical structure, it is a single helix or a double helix and so on. These are called the backbones. This helical, the, this magenta color is called the backbone, both, the, both the, them. And they are made up of phosphates, negatively charged phosphates. And of course, this is the present day story, what we already know about the DNAs. And in the middle are the bases. And these are bases of nitrogen. Uh, nit these are called nitrogenous bases. They contain nitrogen. And they are four bases, A, T, and G, C. A is adenine, T is thymine, G is guanine, and C is cytosine. Uh, the radius of this molecule is one nanometer. So it is a nanomolecule. And the separation between each of the bases is 0 0.34 nanometer. So even if you remember the XRD of Florence Bell, this is the separation is what she was seeing in her XRD in 1939. And now we know that the A always goes with T. A pairs with T, C goes with G. In those days, nothing was known. So we move along. And so of course, it was one of the most important scientific discovery of 20th century as it is considered. Again, as I have already mentioned, C always goes with G and they have a triple hydrogen bond between these two molecules. We don't have to remember the construction of these molecules at this stage, not important. And A always goes with T with a double hydrogen bond. Again, these are the structures of the molecules of these specific nitrogen bases. As I mentioned, uh, uh, we already know that it is a double helix and the backbone is phosphate. So here the phosphates are shown, then in middle is sugar and then which is connected to the base. So here what we are again showing are the double uh, helix structure or a double phosphate bond uh, connected by nitrogen species. So this is what we know now. So now we again go back to 1950. So of course, uh, Florence Bell's XRD image is there. 
but now we are going forward with that. So this is Rosalind Ellie uh, Franklin, and she died very young. She was only 37 years old when she died. So she was born into a prosperous Jewish family in England. She studied in St. Paul's school, and she showed both passion and aptitude for science early in life. Her father pressurized her to take a family tradition of public service and philanthropy. They were very well off Jews who had come to England in 1800s. Uh, fam that family. So he disapproved the university education for women and refused to pay for her education. Uh, of course, her mother and aunt uh, came to her rescue and finally he paid for it. But at that time, Rosalind replied that she will be of little use in anything but science. So finally, her father gave in and agreed to pay for her education. She studied natural science chemistry in Newnham College, Cambridge University. and uh, She did BA. Uh, in 1941, as it was called. Uh, and then she uh, went to this uh, British Coal Utilization Research Association between 1942 to 45. This is the time when World War II is there, and she was doing a lot of research on coal. So she did PhD from Cambridge in 1945, and her research for PhD was on coal and carbon. Uh, during World War II time. So she determined the density, structure, and composition of coal. Porosity of coal was utilized for proposing effective gas masks. And these contained activated charcoal filters. This, these are masks which are shown here. She had five landmark papers. And the title of one of them is Coals in Coal, or Porosity of Coal. And she did more coal as postdoc also. She moved to Paris in 1947 as a postdoc with Jack Quist Marine. Uh, she was physical chemist by training, but she became a skilled X-ray crystallographer in Paris using X-ray diffraction to take three-dimensional images of molecular structures. This is uh, Franklin in uh, Paris. And now in 1950, she was awarded a three-year, this is a prestigious fellowship, Turner and Newell Research Fellowship to work at King's College London. So this name will come, uh, this is the uh, place where she went in England. So this name will come often. In uh, Jan 51, she started working as a research associate, a research associate in Medical Research Council Biophysics Unit under Professor John Brindle. And this is Professor John Brindle. He was the head of the department. So he also was a very um, known person at that time. He had a belief that DNA must be the agent of genetic inheritance, a concept that was not widely recognized in those times. He already had uh, this scientist, Morris Wilkins, working under him on DNA. But that is the part of the story. So Randall told Franklin to come to King's College. And this is what he said. So initial plan for uh, Franklin, Rosalind Franklin, was to work on protein. However, John Randall, there is a letter, famous letter are there, changed this plan. Now she will be working on DNA with graduate student Raymond Gosling. They would be the only staff doing crystallographic studies of DNA. So this is the part which has been taken from the latter. But although this is what he told Franklin, but Morris Wilkins was already working on DNA in King's lab. So there is already a lot of confusion he had, he had created. He was already working on DNA and he had Gosling as his student. And now he was shifting that Gosling from Wilkins to Rosalind Franklin. So this led to very stressful and complicated relationship between Morris and Rosalind Franklin right from the very beginning. So when Rosalind came to King's College, she thought she will be leading the project on DNA, whereas Morris Wilkins thought that Rosalind Franklin is coming to be her assistant. And this is the student who was caught in the middle. So Franklin was given uh, Gosling to supervise. So Franklin supervised the work of doctoral student Raymond Gosling. So this is one of the work which was done uh, in King's College before Franklin arrived there. And this is the work of Wilkins and Gosling. They were already working on DNA. This is a DNA fiber, about 50 micron thick. So we are talking about DNA fiber. And this is a hole you see has been created after the X-ray bombarded it. So this is a fiber drawn from DNA gel after exposure of X-ray beam, which has punched a hole. And this paper is already published. It was already published in, 19, it was published in 1951. And Franklin joined the place in early 51. 
this is uh, all the diffraction images which have been taken by Gosling and Wilkins in 1950. So you will see that again, although it looks different from the Bell's image, already there are uh, brighter spots, many more spots. But then you will, in the end, you will compare it with what Franklin had ultimately taken. And whenever spots come, it gives the information that something crystalline is present. So this is from the DNA is giving its crystal pattern. And if you see the reference has been taken by Gosling writing an article in 1993. Now, what was Rosalind working on when she came to King's College? So she started working on the DNA by, of calf thymus. Uh, Franklin upgraded both the equipment and technique used to make their DNA images. And uh, these were some of the very uh, bright things what she did. Uh, and uh, these are the things which led to her uh, good diffraction pattern. So first thing she told uh, her student to study DNA at changing ambient relative humidity. I will show the some figures later on. And then she also had an ingenious humidity control because she wanted to study DNA at humidity controlled stages. Uh, her camera ha also had to be humidity controlled. So she arranged that also. And she worked with very thin, thin DNA fibers. And now they were thinner than what they had been using earlier. So Franklin was soon able to produce X-ray images of better quality than previously seen. So this is one of the her cameras. So what happens, source is somewhere here, fiber is somewhere here. The diffraction pattern takes place, goes through the camera, and then there'll be a, this is more like a cartoon, this is not the actual apparatus, but then there'll be a film in the back which will take the pattern. So this is the Philip camera, which was used by Franklin and Gosling, her student. So this is the DNA, what she was studying, changing ambient relative humidity. So here on the X axis, is a change in the relative humidity. So what they are studying is how much, as they change the humidity, how much water is retained by the DNA. Okay, this is what they were studying. And they were surprised to see, actually this studies were not, had not been done earlier. And so it is a big deal about this study is what they figured out that about 75% humidity, DNA uptake of water increases heavily. So here DNA is not taking too much water in, but after 75% humidity, it is really soaked with water, okay? So water uptake by DNA fibers, weighing them, at, she was weigh, they were weighing them at different ambient relative humidities. And this is just the weight of the DNA versus relative humidity. And what it showed, especially that these two stages before 75% and above 75% are two different forms of DNA. Below is a crystalline form, 75%. This is called the crystalline form. It is called the A form of DNA. And beyond 75 is called the B form of DNA. And in the next uh, slide, you will see how different the two forms look. So this diffraction pattern on the left is uh, A form of DNA when relative humidity is less than 75%. And on the right is the B form with, sorry, this should have been greater than 75%. So B form is when the relative humidity is greater than 75%. And you see the remarkable difference between these two diffraction patterns. And this B form is what is called photo 51. I will go come to the a little more details of photo 51, as you call. The interesting part uh, to notice in these figures are a few. And uh, let me go to the next slide. And these are now, these were, these are all published now. But uh, this, both the papers are uh, published after the main uh, nature papers came out. So I will just. So wet DNA B form produced sharper diffraction picture. Earlier samples contained both forms. So earlier studies, whatever Wilkins and Gosling were doing before her arrival to King's College, uh, contained both forms, both A and B, and that's why they were fuzzy. They were not clear pictures. And the other thing what they noticed, Franklin, is that the phosphates are on the outside. That she could figure out by this method because phosphates are hydrophilic. So they are absorbing the water. So she could figure out that because uh, DNA is so much affected by the soaking up in water that phosphates have to be outside. So this was another remarkable discovery. So this is the famous photo 51. 
It was taken in May 1952, appeared in Nature 53. There's a lot of a story behind this nature thing that we'll come into. Few things to see in this, not too many details. One thing is, of course, these are the streaks on top of bottom as what Bell had earlier seen. But then there's so many sharp spots. Few things is this X pattern. This is the famous X pattern and which tells that the thing is helix. Then there is a, if you see that these small spots are equidistant, sort of. So they are telling some space, which is again repeating itself. So in uh, diffraction pattern and real molecule, the difference comes that, okay, we, that we go to the thing. Basically, let's say that this X pattern was really vital clue of the double helix. The explanation of this uh, diffraction pattern will come in the next slide. So let me wait till then. So this is a, um, a small primer I'll give just so that we understand the beauty of the pattern, not for, for uh, understanding everything, but what it contains. So this main thing is this X pattern, helical structure. Second thing is these arcs on top of bottom. And third thing, if you will notice, there is also something missing here. We'll come to that. So when the molecule has something small separations, for example, this base pair is a small separation compared to, for example, from here to there, which is a large separation. So small separations in real space translate into big separations in diffraction space. All of uh, this, uh, so for example, here, the small space of base pair, uh, this separation between bases is reflected as this separation, as we had already seen in Bell's from here to here gives this separation. Whereas this pitch of, from here to here, repeat, repeat units is reflected by these tiny separations. So not only you are getting the information of how much is the base pair separation, you are also getting information about the pitch. You are ge also getting information about the angle. This X angle between them is tells you how much is this angle. So it is a very, very rich uh, diffraction pattern before, without going into too much details. I just refer to some more important points. One thing is this, if one starts counting, this is one separation, two separation, three separation, the fourth layer is missing. And this is the crucial point that it is a double helix because there is some kind of a destructive interference. And another point is this streak is very, very dense, which tells that the bases are horizontal. And as we'll see in the B form, actually they're not horizontal. And that's why all the images of uh, by Gosling and Wilkins earlier were fuzzy. So in November 51, she gave a colloquium on the A and B form in DNA and Watson was in audience. This is a long story, which I'll not get into, but if somebody wants to know, but anyway. By 1952, uh, Franklin had X-ray uh, crystallography because she did this uh, figure in uh, 52, uh, May 52. Photographs of both A and B form. And she held the view that B form was helical. Uh, but she still pressed ahead with the intensity analysis of A form because the idea was that it is a crystalline form. It has a sharper spot, so it will give a better information. So she measured intensities of something like 66 independent spots from 12 photos. This is a very Herculean task, which both she and her students were carrying out. In those days, carrying intensities, uh, the, the, whole, um, the whole film is about... Uh, one centimeter by two centimeters, something like that. And measuring 66 uh, independent spots from here was a very difficult task. And there was a scientist, uh, A.R. Stokes in King's College, who had already done the theoretical calculation showing that the diffraction pattern from cylindrically average helical structure will be of X shape. So it was already known that X is due to the helix. So she, she knew that V form is a helix, but however, she did not like model building. So she could have started building model of what DNA will look like. No, she wanted to do experiments, find the results, and then move on to uh, proposing the structure of DNA. However, there were few scientists just very close to King's College in Cavendish, Cambridge, who were doing exactly that. They were doing the model building. So these are the two people. Many of you must have, anybody who knows, uh, has studied uh, DNA will know. This is... a. Uh, Francis Crick and James Watson. James Watson was a young postdoc student. He was only 23 year old. Although he was already very DNA crazy, he had done talk to lots of people. Uh, Francis Crick was a graduate student 
um, on the left. He was a graduate student. He was 34 year old and he was doing theoretical molecular biology. He was studying the structure of hemoglobin. And both of them together were attempting to build model of DNA. At that time, director of the Cavendish Laboratory, where both these people, Francis and Crick, were uh, doing their were trying to do their model building. Uh, William Lawrence Bragg was the director. In 1915, in 1950, well, we are talking about 1951-52. In 1915, he had shared Nobel Prize with his father, uh, Henry Bragg. We know about the Bragg's law. So both of them had shared that prize for the crystal structure by means of X-rays. So Cavendish lab uh, had played dominant role in the development of atomic and nuclear physics in the years before the second world. So why this uh, important to tell Bragg will come later on that uh, why he was relevant in this uh, story of DNA. So now, as I said, James Austin and Francis Crick, these two were working in team. They were together working on the structure of DNA. Uh, uh, model building and uh, Rosalind Franklin and uh, Morris Wilkinson were working separately. They were not even on talking terms with each other. Only this Gosling was uh, shuttling from here to there, trying to uh, do match their some things. So already we have these players. So they working together, they working separately. And now enters Linus Pauling at Caltech, who was in USA. He was already famous for his work on alpha helix model predicted in 1951. And uh, although he won, uh, he won Nobel Prize in 1954 for all this work, but in 1952, he decided to start working on DNA. He was interested in DNA. He was already very famous for his alpha helix. Again, he had predicted it through model. So he wanted to make a model of DNA also. He's considered a very famous scientist of 20th century. So in December 52, a preprint of Linus Pauling came, to, uh, came out on the structure of DNA. And he proposed a three-chained helix with sugar phosphate backbone at the center. So what he suggested that one phosphate backbone here, one phosphate here, and bases on the outside. Now, of course, we know that this is not the correct model. Even in those days, uh, of course, when he made this model, it was not known. So let me just uh, move through the story. But now we know why it, it should not have been proposed is because here phosphate and another phosphate are sitting right next to each other and both are negatively charged. So, okay, let me just move and you will see why. So this is the model which was proposed by uh, Linus Pauling. So this pre, pre uh, so of course, we should be aware that this is not a correct model. So similar triple helix model was made by Watson and Creek earlier in one year ago. Before Linus Pauling uh, preprint arrived in uh, Cambridge, these two people who were already working in models, they had proposed it. And at that time, they had invited Morris Wilkins, Wilkins and Franklin Roosevelt uh, to see their model. They, this is just the, the two places, Cam, uh, Cavendish Lab and King's uh, College is about uh, at a distance of one hour or so. So Franklin, when he saw the model, he demolished the suggestion and was verbally critical of their model. She said phosphate had to be outside because she had already seen her A and B forms and she knew that the, the DNA which it is soaking water. So she knew that the phosphates have to be outside. So the model was an embarrassing failure for Watson and Creek. Bragg felt humiliated. He was there. So he was the director and he prohibited Crick and Watson from model building. No more model building for them. So what to Rosalind Franklin. So incident was an affirmation of her training that the experimentation and patient analysis will reveal the answer. That's why she was not interested in model building ever. Her approach was not that of someone in the race to find the structure. And of course, this many things, these are very well, some things are very well documented. But the things changed once Linus Pauling preprint arrived in Cambridge. He had proposed the three chain. Once Watson and Cree, Crick, uh, Crick saw that uh, triple helix, they knew it is not correct because they had already made and uh, Franklin Roosevelt had already, uh, uh, Franklin, uh, Rosalind Franklin had already said that it is a wrong model. So they knew it is not correct. They also knew that as soon as it was published, the mistake would be pointed out and Pauling would begin racing to discover the correct molecular structure. And we realized that these are the times when they know that race means Nobel Prize. So Bragg now lifted his earlier ban. He was convinced. They talked to Bragg. Many people talked to Bragg that the ban should be lifted. 
And uh, another thing is Bragg had earlier lost to Pauling, Linus Pauling. He had lost the race for the structure of alpha helix. So he was also happy that yeah, you build the model. So Watson and Creek once again were allowed to work on the DNA model. Now, now there are some disturbing events also happened. Uh, unethical uh, is some may say it is a strong word, but that's exactly what was happening. So around this time, photo 51, the XRD that had been taken by Rosalind Franklin and Gosling was shown by Morris Wilson to Watson without her knowledge. He had that photograph and he showed it to Watson. Photo 51 made profound impression on Watson since one could immediately see helical features and count the number of layers and lines. Like I said, there's so much information in that one pattern. There's another famous scientist, Max Bruce. Later, he got a Nobel Prize. He was the advisor of uh, 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 Francis Crick. So he was on a committee at King's because two are neighboring uh, institutes. So this scientist of Cavendish was uh, in the committee of uh, King's College and he gave a copy of Rosalind's DNA report to Crick. Apparently it has all the data, the numbers wise data of the XRD pattern. So frankly did not know that this report has been shown to uh, Francis Crick, who was a student of Max Brits. So at this time, there was another rule uh, which was uh, came up by charge of rule. It's a very important and famous rule. And what he showed that in any DNA sample, A and T will be in equal amount and G and C will be in equal amount. Although he did not know that A always goes with T and G always goes with C, but he knew that a will be in same amount as T and G will be in same amount as C. And with all this information, Watson and Crick built their models and made calculations. Final model was made on February 1953. And in the end, once again, they invited Franklin and Gosling to see their model. And this time she agreed with its accuracy. Now the model was correct. So then three uh, separate papers appeared in Nature on April 25th. The first one was by Watson and Crick molecular structure of nucleic acid. It explained the model, but there was no data. Second paper was by Morris Wilson, Stokes. The pers Stokes is the person who showed that the helical, uh, the helical model with gave X pattern and Wilson article, which this is the title of that paper. And the last paper was Rosalind Franklin and her student Gosling on molecular con uh, configuration of this DNA molecule. And the photo 51 was data was only in this paper. The other two paper did not have any data. Uh, Morris paper, this uh, Morris and Stokes paper had one data on uh, their earlier uh, diffraction pattern, but this was the main data on which Watson and Crick had based their model. So in the acknowledgement of the Watson and Crick paper, at the end of their short paper, Watson and Crick had written in acknowledgement, we have also we have also been uh, stimulated by knowledge of the general nature of unpublished experimental results and ideas of uh, Wilkins, Franklin, and their co-workers at King's College London. However, in, uh, in a NOVA documentary, uh, this Sir John Maddox had said, but in fact, they had particular knowledge of her work. And this was later said by Sir John Maddox, a later nature editor, in Nova documentary. And I, as an editor, would have smelt a rat at that. If we had, if, this is the statement of a later editor. So the strained relationship between Wilkins and other aspects of King's College led Franklin to decide to leave. And, uh, and when, she, before she left, this Randall, the uh, head of the department of MRC told her that she should not be working on DNA because she is leaving King's College, so she should not work on DNA. And her student was uh, reassigned back to Wilkins. He was anyway working with him when she came. Then Gosling was given to DNA uh, to given to Rosalind, and now Gosling was back to Wilkins, with whom he formally completed his thesis work in 1954. In March 1953, Franklin shifted to Burbeck College. Uh, crystallographic research uh, laboratory and she had been invited by John Vernon Ber there and she did uh, work on tobacco mosaic that will come in the later parts. So, uh, so the DNA, the Nobel Prize for unlocking the secrets of DNA was given to these three people in 1962. Rosalind Fran Franklin passed away in 1958 due to cancer. 
So Nobel Prize was given four years after her death. And this is the model, uh, DNA model, actual model, which uh, they had made, uh, Crick and James Watson had, Watson had made. So Watson, Crick, and Wilton did not acknowledge Rosalind's role in their finding until many years later. In, even in their Nobel Prize lectures, they never mentioned her name. Rosalind's data was key to double helix model. She did not know that photo 51 had been used in solving the structure by Watson and Creek. Franklin died of cancer in 1958, four years before the prize was awarded. So now there is a lot of evidence. Um, uh, these are the references that scientists have conclusion concluded that Rosalind Franklin was a contributor and equal player in the discovery process of DNA rather than otherwise, as may have been presented subsequently after the time of discovery. So now we know that there are A form and B form, right? So if you see that A form looks very different than the B form. And if the two are mixed, the diffraction pattern will be very fuzzy. And that's what was happening in the images taken before arrival of Franklin to the King's College and her suggestion, her, her sight that one has to distinguish these uh, wet form, which was a, a form or B form and the dry form was very crucial. This discovery was the most crucial step towards the discovery of DNA structure. Rosalind lived at a time when it was very difficult to be female scientist. She was very headstrong and independent. She was forceful and thrived on intellectual debates. She was independent in midst of old, boy, old boys club. King's College, London. There are many stories, what was happening there. Uh, and he, she had been given a sarcastic nickname, Rosie. Watson in his book has mentioned that, and I'll come to that also. She was called so behind her back. So you can imagine the atmosphere that there are people who are uh, talking behind your back. There are a uh, common room with, in which women were not allowed uh, during lunchtime. Common, common room where people used to take lunch and she was not allowed in those room. And there are people having nicknames about her, talking about her in the back. So then came the book, Double Helix by James Watson. Watson. So it's a popular book. And in this book, uh, after reading this uh, book, after this big, uh, book came out, many of uh, Watson's colleagues were offended. And I will go through some of these things. So Watson takes a shot at Franklin's dress and appearance. Though her features were strong, she was not unattractive and might, this is Watson writing, and might have been quite stunning had she taken even a mild interest in clothes. This she did not. There were never lipstick to contrast with her straight back hair. While at age 31, she dresses. Her dresses showed all the imagination of English blue stocking at present. After the sexist remarks, he has, uh, there are many such things, but they, he had also uh, commented on her uh, experiments and he could not escape that the data they got was from her. Watson was using her sarcastic nickname, Rosie, but came out with statements that her results were important for the breakthrough. This is also from the same book. Watson wrote, by then it had been checked out with Rosie's precise measurements. Rosie, of course, did not directly give us the data. So he is mentioning that although data did not come from her, but they had used her data and she was very argumentative. This is um, one of the colleagues of uh, Franklin who has said in a documentary and this, uh, they collaborated not at King's College, but later in Burbeck College. She was pretty tough person, single-minded, spoke what she believed and could, in fact, be quite fierce. And if she had been a man, it would have been totally unremarked. So these are the things that women had to face, even many now even they are facing. Wilson and Crick were given to, yeah, the draft of the book was given to these two people, Wilkins and Crick, who were also part of the, uh, the, this Nobel Prize. Of course, Franklin was not there. So uh, Howard University, Pre uh, University Press, before publishing it, gave it to these two people to read. And they were especially dismayed, sorry, it should have been dismayed, at the portrayal of Rosalind and wrote back that it should not get published. So Harvard University Press, they withdrew their offer. The final book was published by another publisher. Facing the negative comments, Watson changed his uh, epilogue of the book. He wrote more appreciatively about Franklin and now he wrote that the X-ray work she did at King's is increasingly regarded as superb. 
Watson and Crick seem never to have told Franklin directly what they subsequently have said from public platforms long after her death, that they could not have discovered the double helix in early months of 1953 without her work. And this is um, the autobiography, uh, the not auto, the biography by Brenda Melix. In his autobiography, Wilkins mentioned, Wilkins is the person, uh, the scientist uh, in King's College. Uh, he, he should not have, so he's the one who showed photo 51 to Watson. So in his uh, autobiography, he has mentioned that he should not have shown the photo to Watson. So in his defense, he says he did not realize it will have so much impact. How much time? I did not keep track of time. Anyway, 10 minutes. Okay. So this is just a cartoon. Let me just say, because now DNA is uh, how it reveals its uh, replication. So this is what a double helical DNA will, when it opens up, they become single stranded. Phosphates are outside. Nitrogen bases are inside. And when it opens up, unzips, it becomes single stranded. And that's how it replicates. Because A will always go with T, G will always go with C. So another strand comes, gets built, and the hereditary is can be uh, maintained. And this is the DNA blueprint for life. So this becomes, and this is the zipped part and helical part. So Franklin's contribution to double helix story are no longer overlooked. And she became a pioneering structure virologist after leaving King's College. Uh, so she was at Burbeck College. She published a series of papers on the crystalline structure of viruses now after moving from King's College while working at a more collegiate Burbank College. So she really enjoyed working there. She started with tobacco uh, mosaic virus, one that even today causes economic damage to tobacco farms. She also showed that viral RNA has a single strand, not a double helix-like DNA. Her collaborator, Aaron Klug, uh, continued the viral research and he himself got Nobel Prize in 1982. But Aaron Klug was, uh, he mentioned about Rosalind Franklin as his Nobel lectures. And also, he also has written that she worked beautifully. This is Aaron Klug. Uh, Klug. He was at Burbeck College when Franklin was there. Later, he moved to MRC lab in Cambridge. So she worked beautifully. Her single-mindedness made her first class experimentalist with the sort of skills that blends intelligence and determination. And in his Nobel Prize acceptance speech, he mentioned Franklin, Franklin herself might have stood on this platform had her life not been cut tragically short. So this Aaron Klug received Nobel Prize uh, in 1982 for the development of crystallographic electron microscopy and, his, and its structural elucidation of biological important nucleic acid protein complexes. <laughs> So this is a letter uh, I'm uh, about to finish. This is one of the part of a letter which she wrote to her father in 1940. And uh, you remember father was not very happy that she was becoming a scientist. And he wanted her to take religion more strongly and also take the philanthropy work more strongly. So Rosalind writes, I agree that faith is essential to success in life, but I do not accept your definition of faith. That is belief in life after death. In my view, all that is necessary for faith is the belief that by doing our best, we shall come nearer to success and that success in our aims, that is the improvement of lot of mankind, present and future, is worth attaining. And uh, she was an avid hiker. She used to like hiking. And while hiking in the USA, she fell sick. And later she was diagnosed with uh, cancer. She had uh, ovarian cancer. And after coming back to London, she passed away in uh, 1938. So this is another quote of her, which uh, is very beautiful. Science and everyday life cannot and should not be separated. Science for me gives a partial explanation to life. So these are the references. And uh, recently, uh, there is a Mars rover going from uh, European S Space Agency. And uh, there was a competition to name the rover, and it has been named as Rosalind Franklin. So it is a solar uh, solar powered rover who would uh, study the explore the past life on Mars. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Shikha, for a very wonderful lecture.
and uh, I request Dr. Kuntala to take the questions from the live audience first and then we can take questions from the Zoom audience. I can't. My plate is uh, just just hold. Yeah, yeah. Or otherwise, you can repeat the question. Yeah. Otherwise, me. I'll repeat right. the question. Yeah. Yeah. Can you solve this missing line in the bottom fifty-one? How is the missing line? Yeah. How, oh, how oh. is it? Uh, Recognize that was, uh, okay. yes. Yeah. So the question is, how was it recognized? Uh, what is the it is a static source? It's a static source, and uh, So, uh, because it's a double helix, not a, if it was a single helix, then there will not be any missing reflection spots. But because it's a double helix, whenever this point comes, this point, it is giving that missing spot. And this was, this fourth line missing is very crucial for understanding that it is actually a double helix. Right, right, right. Thank you. So, nice thank you. For, for example, now this 3D tomography or something will uh, be able to Thank you. Any other question? Okay. So, are there any questions? So, uh, from here, uh, uh, one minute, there was only one. Now you can. Okay. So, maybe while we have the others wait, we can ask if there are questions on Zoom. People can just unmute and ask a question. Yes, Shrubhavati. No, I was just wondering that if if she was alive, then would she have got the Nobel Prize or no? There was. Yeah, so there are lots of uh, people have written about it. Even her, uh, this Gosling has written about it. Flug has written about it. And uh, whether she would have gotten or... Uh, uh, so the Flug's research itself, uh, the, what he said in his uh, Nobel Prize lecture, that uh, she would have been standing there with him uh, in receiving that the prize for uh, virus, uh, the structure for nucleic acid on... and. Uh, so for DNA, uh, yeah, it's a it's a question mark because uh, it, the story is this that uh, even the people who were working in with uh, her did not uh, tell what was the main story, and uh, it only came out uh, much much later that uh, what her role is in this whole uh, study. Just, just. just uh, one question from your live audience. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. It's more like one that, you know, it's such a blatant uh, thing that happened with uh, it was making all those statements. People are aware of that. Just uh, even DJ did it not there, but were there any important social uh, implications for that person? I mean, you, does it make any difference anywhere? Watson, Watson really rose up. He he became the director, counselor of uh, Cold Spring Harbor Lab. And uh, in, in late, he, he's still alive. He's 95 years old. In, in later years, he has faced uh, uh, issues and not because of his uh, these kind of things, but he has uh, made statements linking uh, race and genetics and which is uh, causing him the trouble to Watson not uh, something which was political that made a difference that he was to make it you could hear the question right Pandan? no could you oh, so the so the question was ki, uh, okay so uh, can you please repeat the question 
the, the question was that uh, such uh, clear latent violation for their of ethics, and if we knew about these things, were there any social implications of that? Any implication at all for the person? Uh, if there is not there, and I'm, I mean, if you somebody to say that you don't say it was not there, it just doesn't seem to make any difference. You yeah. can do it, you can get away with it. Yeah, yeah he actually, uh, he became the, as I said, the score. Uh, so the question is that uh, there were, uh, what, for example, Watson and Wilkins did, there were a lot of unethical practices they followed. So were there any repercussions for that? Yeah, and uh, as such, a uh, lot of people have written. So that that is the only repercussion they have faced, and uh, otherwise, uh, not as such anything else. Yes. Yeah. In their uh, paper, that uh, the modeling paper, did they mention about photo fifty one? No, they do not ma mention photo fifty one at all. They only mention that we have uh, we had some uh, whatever. Uh, ideas from uh, Wilkins and uh, uh, Rosalind Franklin about their unpublished experiments. But they don't uh, generate the pattern that on their model and then experiments? No, they do not. However, this uh, Rosalind Franklin had mentioned, she did not know that uh, he has taken photo 51 and uh, this thing. Okay. So, she may, so she mentions that uh, this my these uh, these experiments agree with whatever Watson and Crick are proposing. She did not know that so much data has been taken from her by them to generate their model. Maybe that could have come to the novel. Yeah, yeah. Now, hmm. but I think this novel uh, quality is uh, things are made out after all the hard things are gone. Uh, so, so uh, yeah, the Nobel Prize was, uh, so the question is uh, Nobel Awardees, um, the committee about Nobel Committee. So Nobel yeah. Prize was given in 1962. She mm -hmm. is no more there, but uh, the actual details, what all had happened with her research came out in 1968, actually. When this Watson wrote the book and he started mentioning all these things, then uh, R.N. Klug, who was her collaborator and who got Nobel Prize, he went and looked at all her manuscripts and all her papers, and he dug out all the letters and research. So it came out in 1968 what she had done. So nobody knew her role in. Uh, Shikha, may I ask something? Yeah, sure, please. I think you touched upon, but recently there was an article where it said that uh, since she showed this data in an open lecture, whether that uh, figure was shared, maybe you touched upon it and I just missed whether so, that figure so was that, shared or not, it was there. Yeah. Uh, it was not very convincing, but have you looked at the thing and you have any comments on that? So she gave a colloquium in 1951 uh, December. She joined there in uh, January 51. And in 51 December, she gave a colloquium. And in that colloquium, she talked about A and B forms. In 51, her photo 51 was not there. So she has talked about uh, sort of the figures are there. Yeah. And it has a uh, not a double helix, but there are two phosphate strands. She always, with uh, after she did this uh, water uptake experiment, she was always convinced that phosphate is on the outs outside. Okay. Yeah. So those figures I have not put, but... Um, but her this see the this main thing that A goes with T. Mm -hmm. This this fact was not there. A equal amount T equal amount is there, but A goes with T. This fact was not known. So, but A and B form she knew, and we know that B form is very crucial for getting these patterns. Otherwise, nothing will become clear. Okay. With uh, with uh, B form, you will get some. Uh, with A form, you will get something like this, and there is no X pattern. There is no helix. Yeah. And that is because um, B form is a very complicated form. Okay. Thank you. Mm. Are there any further questions? If not, I think we'll take this opportunity to thank uh, Chika for again for a wonderful talk and all these lectures have been really very inspiring and they are available on the YouTube, even the older lectures. So if you go to the JIPWG website or look for IPA website, you will get the link for it. 
okay because i could have typed it in the chat but the people who are present will not get it yeah okay thanks a lot and, uh, thank you uh, and also yeah. thanks to kuntala for uh, yeah this yeah. Uh, and i should also add that the most of the plenary sessions from the equip international conference for women in physics will be also available on the youtube after the conference is over so we look forward to a lot of interesting material which will come out yes so thank you kuntala and thank you iop for hosting this uh, uh, pavinari lecture and uh, yes shikha and all the audience both on the zoom and uh, present and we look forward to the, you meeting you again in the next lecture thank you